whenever I'm typing the notes for these videos and I come to the name Nicki Minaj, I type out the name, it comes out Nicki Minja. I guess that's because the word ninja. I guess Nicki Minaj is a ninja warrior. Greetings, one and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, we might as well get some backtracks taken care of, huh? Yes, especially since the month is almost over and it uh, looks like it's going to be done in the second half of the month more often than the first half, so what can you do, right? Uh, but anyway, yes, Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, with at least one Spotlight album review. And I've got a lot of ground to cover today, so let's just jump right in and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of June 2020. 65 years ago this month saw the release of the Dinah Washington album For Those In Love. Produced by Bob Shad, arranged by Quincy Jones, and accompanied by Clark Terry on trumpet, Jimmy Cobb on drums, and Witten Kelly on piano, this album features her interpretations of standards such as Cole Porter's I Get a Kick Out of You, the Dorothy Fields and Arthur Schwartz tune Make the Man Love Me, and the Rogers and Hart songs This Can't Be Love and I Could Write a Book, this recording of which appeared in a first season episode of the TV series Ash vs. Evil Dead. Also released in June of 1955 was the self-titled album by Lee Konitz with Warren Marsh. Produced by Neshwi Ertegun, the album saw alto saxophonist Lee Konitz and tenor saxophonist Warren Marsh, backed by pianist Sal Mosca, drummer Kenny Clark, and bassist Oscar Pettiford. Tracks included featured the Harry Warren tune There Will Never Be Another You, the Charlie Parker classic Donna Lee, and the standard Topsy, originally made famous by Benny Goodman. Six decades ago this month, Ernest Tubb and his Texas Troubadours released their self-titled album. This blend of country standards and Ernest Tubb originals was produced by Owen Bradley and Paul Cohen and included his takes on the classic Yellow Rose of Texas, the Cindy Walker penned Two Glasses Joe, and Tubb's own Kansas City Blues. The Texas Troubadours included fiddler Tommy Jackson, pianist Floyd Kramer, and guitarists Buddy Emmons and Grady Martin. Also released in June of 1960 was The Three Faces of Youssef Latif. The title is likely in reference to the three instruments Latif plays throughout the album. The oboe on the jazz classic I'm Just a Lucky So-and-So and the Latif original Saltwater Blues, the flute on the originals From Within and Latif Minor Seventh, and the saxophone on the track Going Home, based on a classical composition by Antonin Dvorak, and the appropriately titled for nowadays Quarantine. In June of 1965, The Birds released their debut album, Mr. Tambourine Man. It peaked at number 6 on the Billboard 200 and number 7 on the UK Albums Chart, and is included in Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. The single release of the title track became the first song written by Bob Dylan to reach number 1 on any pop music chart. It hit number 1 on the US, UK, Irish, and South African singles charts, and peaked at number 2 in Canada. Subsequent single, All I Really Want to Do, also written by Bob Dylan, was a top 10 hit in the UK, but just barely reached the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. This was the first album, and The Birds the first artist, to be described with the phrase, folk rock. Also released 55 years ago this month was The Angry Young Them. The debut album by the Van Morrison-led rock band Them failed to chart in the UK, but when released in the US a month later under the title Them, it peaked at number 54. The single Here Comes the Night, which was only included on the US version of the album, by the way, and Mystic Eyes were both top 40 hits on the Billboard Hot 100. Gloria peaked outside the top 40. Here Comes the Night reached number 2 in the UK. The album also includes covers of the pop standard Get Your Kicks on Route 66 and the John Lee Hooker Blues classic Don't Look Back. Half a century ago this month saw the release of Alone Together, the solo debut album by former Traffic member Dave Mason. It reached the peak position of number 22 on the Billboard 200 over the course of its 25-week chart run. It boasts guest appearances by Bonnie Bramlett, Rita Coolidge, Leon Russell, and several others. The album's only single, Only You Know and I Know, just missed the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number 42. This is believed to be the first album released on multicolor marbled vinyl, in this case a mix of pink, brown, and beige. It was also among the thousands of works whose master tapes were reportedly destroyed in the 2008 Universal Backlot Fire. Also released in June of 1970 was Free's third album, Fire and Water. It peaked in number two during its 18 weeks on the UK Albums Chart and reached number 17 on the Billboard 200. This album also saw only one single released from it, but it was a big one. All Right Now was a number one hit in Denmark and Sweden, reached number two in the UK, number four in the US, Canada, and France, and was a top ten hit in at least seven other countries. Several artists, including Mr. Big and Government Mule, have covered the album's title track, but its most popular version by Wilson Pickett reached number two on the Billboard R&B chart in 1971. 
In June of 1975, funk group War released their seventh album, Why Can't We Be Friends? It reached number 8 on the Billboard 200, number 14 on the Billboard Jazz Albums chart, was the band's third consecutive album to top the Billboard R&B chart, and was their fourth consecutive album to earn gold certification in the U.S. The album spawned two of the band's most recognizable hit singles. The title track climbed to number 6 on both the U.S. and Canadian singles charts, and Lowrider peaked at number 7 in the U.S., number 6 in Canada, and number 12 in the U.K. Lowrider is one of the most ubiquitous songs in pop music history, having appeared in a multitude of films, been covered by dozens of artists, and sampled in several more recent songs. The song Why Can't We Be Friends soundtracked the historic docking of the U.S. Apollo space module with the Soviet Soyuz space capsule in July of 1975. Forty-five years ago this month also saw the release of the Isley Brothers' 13th album, The Heat Is On. It was their first album to top the Billboard 200, and sold half a million copies within its first month, eventually being certified double platinum by the RIAA. The album's lead-off single, Fight the Power, spent three weeks at the top of the Billboard R&B singles chart, longer than any other single that year. It also reached number four on the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up single, For the Love of You, reached the top ten of the R&B chart and the top 40 of the Hot 100. Fight the Power is not to be confused with the Public Enemy single of the same name, although the hip-hop group did borrow the song's lyric, We Gotta Fight the Powers That Be. Happy 40th anniversary this month to Uprising, the 12th album by Bob Marley and the Wailers. It peaked at number 45 on the Billboard 200 and number 41 on the Billboard R&B albums chart. It was a top 10 album in the UK, Austria, Sweden, and Norway, and it topped the New Zealand albums chart. The single, Could You Be Loved, reached number 2 in New Zealand and number 5 in the UK, and it also charted on the Billboard R&B Singles Chart. Although it only charted in New Zealand and modestly at that, the single, Redemption Song, would go on to become one of Marley's most acclaimed and popular songs. Uprising was Marley's final album released during his lifetime, before he died of cancer 11 months later. June of 1980 also saw the release of the self-titled debut album by Huey Lewis and the News. The band would of course go on to become one of the most popular and successful of the 1980s, but this first album went almost completely unnoticed. It didn't even crack the Billboard 200 chart, it only reached number 203, and neither of the two singles from it, uh, Some of My Lies Are True and Now Here's You, neither of them even charted, but this is such a good album, it's just packed full of good songs. Uh, Stop Trying, and Don't Ever Tell Me That You Love Me, and Hearts are just some of the great songs on here. And that's one thing that I miss about the 1980s, is that artists would get a second chance if their first album flopped. I mean, you know, nowadays, uh, you'd never would have heard of Huey Lewis the News because their first album just completely flopped. But uh, this, this is a little bit different from the rest of their discography. The songs are a little bit more fast-paced, a little bit more new wave influenced than the barroom rock, I guess you'd say, of the rest of their discography. But still... This, in my opinion, this is a, an album not to be missed. It's right up there with the rest of their discography. In June of 1985, Sting released his solo debut album, The Dream of the Blue Turtles. It topped the album's charts in Australia, Italy, and the Netherlands. It reached the number four spot in Canada, France, and Norway, peaked at number three on the UK album's chart, and number two in the US, and earned Grammy nominations for Album of the Year and Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. The single, If You Love Somebody, Set Them Free, was a top five single on the Billboard Hot 100 and went top 20 in Australia and Ireland. Fortress Around Your Heart went top 10 in the US and reached the top 40 in the Netherlands. Cold War themed single, Russians, proved the most popular, becoming a top 10 hit in France, Germany, and the Netherlands, and top 20 in the US, the UK, and Australia. Also released 35 years ago this month was Weird Al Yankovic's third album, Dare to be Stupid. It spent eight weeks on the Billboard 200 and peaked at number 50 but within a year it was certified gold by the RIAA. Lead single Like a Surgeon, a parody of Madonna's Like a Virgin, charted in the top 50 of the Billboard Hot 100, the top 40 of the Canadian singles chart, and the top 20 in Australia. Yoda, a Star Wars-themed takeoff on the Kinks' Lola, had been conceived by Al five years earlier, but clearance issues from George Lucas and original songwriter Ray Davies delayed its commercial release until this album. Two of Al's originals got measurable attention and music video treatment for the first time, the title track, a style parody of Devo, and One More Minute, a spoof of doo-wop love songs. This was the first album of comedic music to be released on CD, and also it was the first of eight of Al's albums to be nominated for the Grammy for Best Comedy Recording, an award that he won twice. In June of 1990, Mariah Carey released her self-titled debut album. It sat at the top of the Billboard 200 for 11 consecutive weeks and also hit number one on the Canadian Albums Chart. It was a top 10 album in six other countries, including Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. It enjoys multi-platinum certifications in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. 
The singles released from this album enjoyed similar success, making Mariah Carey the first artist since the Jackson 5 to have their first four singles reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Vision of Love and Love Takes Time also topped the Billboard R&B and Adult Contemporary charts, and Someday and I Don't Wanna Cry landed in the top five of both charts. All four singles reached the top two on the Canadian singles charts as well. Also released 30 years ago this month was Nelson's debut album After the Rain. It spent over a year on the Billboard 200 album chart, peaking at number 17, and eventually being certified double platinum. Lead-off single, Can't Live Without Your Love and Affection, topped the Billboard Hot 100 and was a top 20 hit in Canada and Australia. Follow-up singles include After the Rain, which reached number 6 on both the U.S. and Canadian singles charts, and More Than Ever, which made the U.S. top 20 and the Canadian top 40. Their success landed Nelson in the Guinness Book of World Records as the only family to hold number one recordings in three consecutive generations, beginning with their grandparents, Ozzie and Harriet, and including their father, Ricky Nelson. Happy 25th anniversary this month to Jagged Little Pill, Alanis Morissette's third album overall and her first outside of Canada. It topped the album's charts in at least a dozen countries, including the U.S., the U.K., Portugal, Denmark, and Morissette's native Canada. The album's success made Morissette the first Canadian artist to achieve double diamond certification in Canada, and the youngest to be certified diamond in the U.S. until Britney Spears four years later. Of the six singles released from the album, four hit number one in Canada. Hand in My Pocket, Ironic, You Learn, and Head Over Feet. You Oughta Know reached number six in both Canada and the U.S., and All I Really Want reached number two in Canada. On the U.S. charts, Ironic hit number four and You Learn peaked at number six. Jagged Little Pill won Grammys and Junos for both Album of the Year and Best Rock Album. Morissette nabbed the Single of the Year and Songwriter of the Year Junos in two consecutive years. Also released in June of 1995 was And the Music Speaks, the sophomore album by R&B group All for One. It reached number 27 on the Billboard 200 and is certified platinum by the RIAA. It climbed to number 25 in Canada, number 13 in New Zealand, and number 4 in Zimbabwe. Of the four singles released from the album, I Can Love You Like That was the most successful, peaking at number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100, number 2 in New Zealand, and number 12 in Australia. Follow-up single, I'm Your Man, went top 40 in New Zealand. Both singles earned Grammy nominations in the category of Best Pop Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals. I Can Love You Like That was also a number 1 country hit for John Michael Montgomery. In June of 2000, Bon Jovi released their seventh album, Crush. Their first album in five years, it went number one in nine countries, including the UK, Australia, Germany, and Italy. It peaked at number two in Japan and Spain, number four in Canada, and number nine in the US, where it was certified double platinum. Its first single, It's My Life, was a number one hit in Austria, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, and went top five in Germany, the UK, Australia, and Sweden. Despite only reaching number 33 on the Billboard Hot 100, the single still achieved double platinum status in the U.S. Follow-up single, Say It Isn't So, went top 10 in the U.K. and Australia, while Thank You For Loving Me hit the top 20 in Austria and the U.K. Crush was the first Bon Jovi album ever to be nominated for a Grammy, in this case for Best Rock Album. Also released 20 years ago this month was Riding With The King by B.B. King and Eric Clapton. It topped the blues album charts in the U.S. and Australia. It was a number one album in Norway, reached number two in New Zealand and Germany, number four in Canada and Japan, and climbed to number three on the Billboard 200 and went double platinum in the U.S. The title track was a top 40 single on the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart, as well as the Polish singles chart. The album also includes renditions of blues classics such as Three O'Clock Blues, Key to the Highway, Worried Life Blues, as well as the Sam and Dave soul single Hold On I'm Coming, and the Harold Arlen Johnny Mercer standard Come Rain or Come Shine. Fifteen years ago this month, Coldplay released their third album X and Y. It was the band's first album to peak at the top of the Billboard 200, and it was a number one album in numerous other countries, including Canada, the UK, Australia, France, Argentina, Greece, Finland, and Portugal. It holds multi-platinum certifications in more than a dozen countries, including triple platinum in the U.S. and nine times platinum in the U.K. Lead-off single, Speed of Sound, was a top ten single in the U.S., Australia, and the Netherlands, and peaked at number two in the U.K. and Canada. Second single, Fix You, charted at number four in both the U.K. and Canada, but missed the top 40 of the Australian and U.S. charts. Third single, Talk, topped the Dutch singles chart, reached number four in Canada, and the top ten in the U.K. June of 2005 also saw the release of George Strait's 23rd album, Somewhere Down in Texas. It topped the Billboard Country Albums chart and was his second album to reach number one on the Billboard 200. Single She Let Herself Go gave Strait his 40th number one hit on the Billboard Country Singles chart. Another single, You'll Be There, was a top five country hit. 
his cover of Merle Haggard's The Seashores of Old Mexico, which was a top 10 Canadian country hit for Hank Snow back in 1971, just missed the Billboard Country Top 10, peaking at number 11. Straits' version received a Grammy nomination for Best Male Country Vocal Performance. Leanne Womack duets on the album track Good News, Bad News. In June of 2010, Drake released his debut album Thank Me Later. It peaked at the top of the album's charts in Drake's home country of Canada and in the U.S., where it also hit number one on the R&B and hip-hop albums charts. In the U.K., it topped the R&B albums chart and reached number 15 on the primary albums charts. Its first three singles, Over, Find Your Love, and Miss Me featuring Lil Wayne, landed in the top three of the Billboard R&B singles chart and went top 20 on the Billboard Hot 100, with Find Your Love hitting number five. Fancy, featuring T.I. and Swizz Beats, was a top 40 single on the Billboard Hot 100. In Canada, Find Your Love hit the top 10 and Over went top 20. The album also boasts features by Alicia Keys, Jay-Z, and Nicki Minaj. Also celebrating its 10th anniversary this month is Christina Aguilera's sixth album, Bionic. Her first album in almost four years, it peaked at number one in the UK, South Korea, and Greece, and reached number three in Australia, Canada, and the US. It peaked in the top 10 in more than a dozen other countries. Lead-off single, Not Myself Tonight, hit the top 10 in Japan, South Korea, and Hungary, was a top 20 hit in Canada, the UK, and the Netherlands, and charted in the, t in the top 40 in the US, Australia, and New Zealand. Follow-up single, Woohoo, featuring Nicki Minaj, reached the Billboard Hot 100 and just missed the Canadian top 40. Five years ago this month, Casey Musgraves released her sophomore album, Pageant Material. It topped the UK and US country albums charts, peaked at number 3 on the Billboard 200 and number 6 in Canada. It received a Grammy nomination for Best Country Album and a CMA Award nomination for Album of the Year. First single, Biscuits, was a top 40 hit on the US and Canadian country singles charts. Second single, Dime Store Cowgirl, charted outside the top 40 in the US. The album appeared on year-end best albums lists from numerous publications including Time Magazine, Spin, Pop Matters, Paste, and NPR. June of 2015 also saw the release of Giorgio Moroder's 14th album, Deja Vu. His first album in 23 years, it came about after his modest resurgence in popularity following his appearance on Daft Punk's 2013 album, Random Access Memories. It reached number one on the Billboard Dance Electronic Albums chart, reached number 18 in Italy, number 23 in Australia, and number 30 in the UK. Single Right Here Right Now featuring Kylie Minogue went top 20 in Finland and top 40 in Spain, and topped the Billboard Dance Singles chart, as did follow-up single Deja Vu featuring Sia. The album also features appearances by Charlie XCX, Kalise, and Britney Spears. Okay, on to this month's Spotlight album, which I have a lot to say about, so I'm going to try and keep the intro short. And yes, I, I do only have one Spotlight album this month. Sorry about that. I was originally going to do two, and I actually even went so far as to have already bought them, but they didn't cost me very much, and I figure I can Spotlight them again five years from now, right? But anyway, I when I looked closer and re-examined the list of anniversary albums, I saw this one on here, and I had to go with this one. You'll see why in just a minute as I uh, explain the intro to this. Uh, the album kind of has a personal significance to me. It did even before I listened to it, which sounds a little weird, but again, bear with me. Uh, this album is 15 years old. It was released in June of 2005. It is the 12th album by Ry Cooter. It is called Chavez Ravine. Now, uh, this is a concept album about the sh history of the Chavez Ravine community. Now, uh, as in a historical context here, Chavez Ravine is a geographical feature in the Los Angeles area where Dodger Stadium now sits. And I grew up in the greater LA area, and my dad would take me and my brother to four or five Dodgers baseball games every year. So I have some personal memories of Dodger Stadium. It, it, was, it was a part of my childhood, so it's, I've got a personal connection to it, even though I'm not a fan of baseball anymore. But what I didn't know until I started researching this album is that before Dodger Stadium existed, Chavez Ravine was home to a Mexican-American community that was eventually evicted when the city of Los Angeles purchased the land. And uh, they were originally intending to build a public housing project there, but that fell through after a very conservative mayor was elected into office in Los Angeles. And the Dodgers owner, Walter O'Malley, wanted to move the team from Brooklyn, New York to Los Angeles, bought the land, and the rest is history. Now, as you may or may not know, I think I've mentioned once or twice on this channel that I've never been much for concept albums, rock operas, that sort of thing. And I don't know why, because for... 15 years or so now, I've been much more of an albums person than a singles person anyway, but still, I, for some reason, I've strayed away from anything that describes itself as a concept album. But this one, this just might be the tipping point. This might 
uh, have turned turned me a corner, so to speak, with this. Uh, this is I, I I had a feeling, or I at least hoped that this album would be a worthwhile listen, but I underestimated its impact. I mean, this is far more engaging and interesting of an album than I ever could have expected it to be. I mean, first of all, look at the packaging. It is a it's a double album, by the way, two LPs, and it comes in a gatefold with this gorgeous booklet. Let's see if I can put it into frame here. It and on the back side of the booklet is a map of what Chavez Ravine used to look like before Dodger Stadium went in, and it's got illustrations and you know, you know, photographs and all sorts of stuff. And uh, Ry Cooter does a little write-up, a little intro write-up on each of the songs. It's got every song's lyrics in both English and Spanish. And just it's just gorgeous. It has it puts a lot of the songs in historical context and all that stuff. This could have been just two LPs in a gatefold with nothing else, but they went all out for this. It's just got that gorgeously illustrated booklet uh, inside it and everything. Now about half the songs on this album are sung in English and the other half in Spanish, so it's very much a bilingual album, and since it is a concept album about a Mexican-American community, you can imagine it's got a lot of Mexican or Latin-based rhythms and sounds in it, so yes it's very much of a Latin jazz, uh, Latin jazz folk in some ways. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and now look at the cover art also on this. And you can see the, the UFO up here in the corner. Uh, that's something of a plot device that crops up two or three times over the course of this album. And I'm, I'm guessing that it's, it's kind of like a metaphor for Ry Cooter himself, witnessing the history of the, of, uh, the community, what happens and all that stuff. Very, very clever. And uh, yeah, the, the metaphor is, uh, pops up in the opening tracks on both LPs. Uh, the op the uh, first track on the entire album, Poor Man's Shangri-La, that is gorgeous. It has beautiful, gentle Mexican rhythms and stuff. It's just a fantastic, it's a great way to open the album, just a very gentle introduction to the album. And uh, the opening track on LP2 is called El UFO Cayo, which includes spacey, mysterious kind of sounds, uh, which is thanks to what I believe are the only use of any sort of synthesizers on the album. So that makes that track stand out a little bit. So yeah, a very, very interesting way to open each half of the album. Now, several of the tracks on this album, uh, roughly half, um, I didn't calculate the exact ratio, and most of them are actually on uh, the first LP, the first half of the album are what I th like to think of as slice of life or snapshot songs that, and most of them give off kind of a Mexican folk song vibe, even though they were more recently written. And uh, they basically just describe cultural aspects of life in Chavez Ravine back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, for instance, Ejercito Militar is about young men in the neighborhood who went off to serve in the army. And the song Muy Fifi is about a mother and daughter who are arguing over a young man that the daughter is dating and the mother doesn't think that this young man is right for, his, for her daughter. And uh, Ersi Arvisu is a vocalist who sings lead on those two songs plus one other on the album. And her mother, Rita, actually wrote Ejercito Militar. And that's an interesting thing about this album, one of the many interesting th things about this album, is that several of the artists that appear on it have personal ties to Chavez Ravine. The, the Arvisu family actually lived in Chavez Ravine back when, uh, when Ersi and her sister were very, very young. And uh, two of the three songs on this album were written by Lalo Guerrero, Corrido de Boxeo, which is about two brothers he knew in the neighborhood who were boxers, and Barrio Viejo, about the old neighborhood he grew up in. And uh, Lalo Guerrero, unfortunately, sadly passed away three months before the album was released. And he was, as you can tell, he was also a resident of Chavez Ravine back in the 40s. And one of the last uh, snapshot songs I want to mention on this album is called Chinito Chinito. And basically what it's about is um, the Mexican-American citizens of the town uh, poking fun at, you know, making playful fun of the Chinese residents. And the lyrics might come off as being racist, but when you look at the uh, context of the fact that um, Chinese Americans and Mexican Americans lived side by side in Chavez Ravine and other parts of LA with, without ever any, uh, you know, with very little anyway, racial strife between them. That's why I turned the song as playfully racist. So you, know, you can take that, take with that what you will. Uh, read the lyrics to the song, uh, read the lyrics to all these songs, honestly, they're just all fascinating. Now the last song on LP1 of this album is it kind of serves as an intermission or a break of sorts. It's another one of those slice of life songs, but it's kind of separate from the album because it wasn't written by anybody connected to Chavez Ravine, not directly anyway. It's a cover of the song Three Cool Cats, which was originally written by uh, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller and originally performed by the Coasters. 
so it's just it's it, but it's it's a very interesting cover of it. It's a Mexican American uh, got a Mexican Mexican bent to it. And uh, the second half of the album is where we get into the uh, much heavier um, historical kind of stuff, the stuff where uh, you see the beginning of the end for Chavez Ravine. Uh, Onda Calejera tells the story of the Zoot Suit Riots of 1943, which, and yes, you'll recognize that term, Zoot Suit Riots, in which young Mexican Americans were attacked by American servicemen, which almost certainly fueled racist sentiment that eventually led to the evictions from and redevelopment of Chavez Ravine. So yeah, the Zoot Suit Riots were basically the, the first step or the foreshadowing of the what was eventually called the Battle of Chavez Ravine, which was a 10-year fight for the residents to uh, stay living in Chavez Ravine. It's a very interesting thing. Look at look the whole thing up on Wikipedia. It's really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, you just thought that that Cherry Pop and Daddy song, Zoot Suit Riots, was just totally innocent, didn't you? It has a very dark historical context to it. The song Don't Call Me Red is about Frank Wilkinson, who was suspected of being a communist sympathizer. That's where the word red comes in. And this was, of course, during the peak of McCarthyism back in the 50s, uh, due to his push for the public housing project that almost got built in Chavez Ravine. Uh, public housing was seen as socialist and communist, while well, I'm sure it probably still is. And the song uh, is very, very interesting to listen to because it intersperses sound bites of Wilkinson, which I assume are taken from interviews and other audio sources. So that was, that's a very, very interesting song, especially when you learn the historical context of the song and of the entire album, honestly. The song It's Just Work For Me is told from the point of view of one of the many bulldozer operators who are hired by the developers to tear down the neighborhood after its residents are evicted, or in the case of a few families, while they're still there, they had to call in the uh, police or the sheriff's department actually to get some of the families out of their homes. And what's interesting about this song, what's really, really interesting about the song is that the Dozer Man seems emotionally detached, not just from the destruction of the neighborhood, but also from the prospect of a big new ballpark being built. So it's like he has literally no emotional attachments to either side of the issue. It's it's just work for me is, is the title of the song. So, And then the very next song, In My Town, is one of the most memorable on the album in a rather shocking way, I'll let you know right now, forewarning. Uh, in the song, Cooter inhabits a character who is very conservative and wants to clean up Chavez Ravine. And he pulls no punches in the lyrics, which can be quite explicit. An example of the lyrics is, If you're brown, back down. If you're black, get back. Better white than right. Better dead than red. Yeah. The lyrics are shockingly relevant even right now. You know, 50, 60 years after Chavez Ravine. So yeah, th this album, I tell you, it's it's a it's an experience. Now, the most heart-wrenching song for me on this album by far, and one of the saddest I've heard all year, is Third Base Dodger Stadium. And it paints a very sad and extremely vivid image. I, you got, I mean, you got to hand it to Ry Cooter on this. Uh, a very vivid image of how people who used to live in Chavez Ravine, and in some cases uh, went on to work at Dodger Stadium after it opened, identify where they lived by what part of the stadium now sits on the spot where their house used to stand. One of the most uh, affecting and striking lyrics for me in the entire song is second base right over there I see grandma in her rocking chair. It, it's making me a little misty eyed. I mean, if, if that lyric, if that song doesn't get you, um, I mean, if you listen to one song off this album, listen to third base Dodger Stadium. It is the saddest, as I said, the saddest song I've heard all year. I was not prepared for the emotional impact of this album, or of that song in particular. It's a good thing I don't still have any sort of attachment, really, to baseball or to the Dodgers anymore, because I don't think I could ever set foot in Dodger Stadium again, knowing the history that's effectively buried underneath it. So, anyway, uh, moving on from that song. The closing track, Soy Luz y Sombra, which is Spanish for I Am Light and Shade, is a musical adaptation of the Cloud Forest poem, which is a classic poem. I think it was written uh, anonymously. And it gently persuades the listener to, no matter what the man-made events, uh, conflicts, hardships, barriers that face us, to have faith in the order of things, whether you call it fate or nature or karma or the universe or what have you. And that just gives an absolutely perfect transcendental, if you will, uplift of a note to end the album on. And it was just an absolutely, I said, as I said, an absolutely perfect way to end this album. And especially after that last track, Third Base Dodger Stadium. So yes, as I said, I, 
I was not prepared uh, for the effect that this album had on me. And as you, as if you couldn't tell, something is there's going to be have to be a hell of a spotlight album this year for this to be knocked out of number one in my year in ranking of spotlight albums. This was, was just absolutely fantastic. Uh, one of the one of the best, most impactful albums I have ever ever listened to, honestly. Well, that was quite a ride, wasn't it? Uh, I hope I didn't make that spotlight review too long, but I hope it was worth your time and your effort. And this, yeah, as I said, this was one of the most engaging albums ever. But anyway, before I make this video any longer, that'll do it for Backtracks for June of 2020. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Suggestions, comments, questions, constructive criticisms, bring them on in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that not notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.